I'm James Turk. I'm a director of the Gold Money Foundation. It's my pleasure to be here today with John Brimlow. John's uh, an old friend of mine. Uh, he's probably been involved in the gold market just about as long as I have, uh, 30 plus years, and we'll leave it at that. Horrible. John runs a service called Gold Jottings, which is uh, used by institutional investors all around the world. I find it a very valuable service because what he does is he looks at gold premiums, in other words, the physical side of the market rather than the paper side, and makes conclusions about whether the gold market is, is tight or whether the gold market is a little bit loose at any moment in time. John, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Honored to be here. Tell, tell me a little bit about Gold Jottings um, and you know goldjottings.com, your website. Um, you look at premiums everywhere in the world, or are I look at them every, every major market where I can find a real price. This is a function of the internet. Um, years ago, we just heard rumors that the souk was a buyer or the Indians weren't a buyer. Uh, the writers used to carry stories about whether India was or wasn't a buyer, but in general, these turned out to be quite dishonest. So they eventually abandoned that. However, with the internet, uh, you can actually uh, take a price from a certain country at a specific time in the day and therefore convert it through its foreign exchange rate and work out what the dollar price is. Uh, if the dollar price is high enough to warrant importing and uh, covering uh, transshipment costs and any duties there might be, then that country's a buyer. And when it isn't, it isn't. Uh, and it cuts through a lot of uh, nonsense and a lot of prevarication. It's also very quick. Uh, the really key market in the gold physical trade is India. India is perfectly capable of turning on a dime. It can go from being emphatically not an importer to emphatically a huge importer in a matter of a few days. It takes quite a lot of time for that to trickle through to most gold observers. Uh, I might also say that more, more, the people best in a position to judge this are of course are the bullion bankers who are inhibited from saying that because their customers don't like their activities being disclosed or the virtues of being independent. Yeah. What causes the premiums uh, to go up and, and go down? Is it just merely a change in price, or is there some other factor that uh, comes into play as well? Uh, so, uh, in essence, the world gold price, i.e. the US dollar gold price, is the, is the starting point. But of course, the foreign exchange rate of the particular country is very critical. This is what happened in the first quarter of 2009, after the big financial crash. Um, uh, foreign exchange rates in the Asian countries uh, collapsed. And the consequence of this was that even though the gold price had gone up somewhat in dollars, in Asian currency terms it had gone on up enormously. Uh, and the Asian uh, fellows responded to this by selling into the price. Mm -hmm. So in early 2009, when there were plenty of stories of Americans and Europeans buying vast quantities of gold, which were true, and the gold price was going up in a very satisfactory way. Unfortunately, Asia was a huge seller. Uh, on a scale, in fact, that hasn't been seen in a generation. The interesting thing about the current run, in particular this morning, is that the Asians have not backed out of the market. Some of the markets are at discounts, but they're not at the huge discounts that would warrant the collection and, and um, processing and shipping of gold overseas. This means that the gold market is in much healthier shape than it was back there in January, February 2009. Yeah. You know, this is one of the things that I find invaluable about your service. And it also shows the way the nature of the market has changed over the past 10 years. Because, you know, previously when gold was under $1,000 an ounce, those Asian buyers would wait for a 20 or 30 percent correction before, you know, it'd go back into premiums. Um, and this time around, when it went over $1,000, uh, they're not necessarily waiting for those pullbacks. It seems like no. those, um, uh, those import levels are you know, following the gold price up pretty much. I think uh, internet works both ways, of course, and the Indians and uh, the Chinese are perfectly capable of reading about the American financial system and making deductions about what this means for American appetite and European appetite for gold. But the amazing thing about this particular situation in July, August 2011 is that this is traditionally the, the time of the year when the Asian physical demand is soft. Uh, there's, in India, they're getting rained on, and uh, it, it seems to be that China is a function, it, it focuses on the Lunar New Year. So in essence, the, the strong part of the gold market, uh, based purely on the Asian appetite, is for Q4 and Q1 of a given year. And uh, June through August um, it can be quite slack. 
this has just not been the case this time. First of all, the gold price, of course, has performed. But secondly, the Asians have, by and large, followed fall the world gold price up, which I find quite surprising. Yeah. Have you seen this before that you can recall, where you've seen this kind of strong demand in an off-season no, time of the year? Nothing this intense. If you go back to 1999, when the central banks were doing their best to destroy the gold market, the Indians bought prodigious amounts of gold in the midsummer of 1999. Um, and they also did in the midsummer of 2007. So if the price goes down enough, they act. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're very judicious about their price uh, judgments. And um, this is really quite a surprise. The way I describe the gold market is that there tend to be two types of buyers. The trend followers or momentum players that you know, follow the price. And then there are the accumulators that wait for pullbacks. You know, it's always been my view that the Asians were more accumulators than trend followers. But you know, to a certain extent, the fact that the, uh, they've been following the price up, it's almost that they become trend followers as well. I don't know. It may be this that <coughs> they have an opinion of what's cheap. Um, there's no doubt that the Indians in particular are accumulators. Uh, you've seen this amazing story about the Temple in Traveling Corps that's apparently got six or 700 tons of gold in its basement um, and untouched for centuries. Uh, that's impressive. My impression of the Chinese market, though, is that there's more speculative action on Ch in China. Mm. Uh, China has not really been a significant factor in the world gold market, contrary to everything you read, until the latter part of last year. That's the first time that net Chinese imports became significant. Prior to that, domestic demand was taken care but, of by domestic production. Extraordinary growth in Chinese domestic gold production. Yeah. Uh, I was just talking uh, recently to Jim Rickards of uh, Tangent Capital, and he was making the observation that, uh, in his view, that uh, these mines in China are being worked so hard that within a few years, uh, domestic production within China is likely to fall off. What will that do to the gold price? Well, obviously, a tremendous um, boost. Uh, Chinese mine production is something on which it's very difficult to get any hard intelligence on. But the fact is it's expanded by double-digit amount <clears throat> for 13 or 14 years. Nothing like this has been seen anywhere else in the world. And on top of that, of course, the number, the volume they're producing now is massively more than any other country produces. It's an amazing performance. I put it down primarily to the undervaluation of the Chinese currency. But the, the, no one seems to say that there are any huge new geological development in China. So it looks like what's happening is the Chinese are work, just working out the marginal deposits, just exactly as they would do in America if the, if the gold price went up more. And if, if they are dealing with the, the usual kind of shallow, possibly surface deposits, uh, th this has been going on too long for these deposits to, to last. Yeah. So it may well be that we'll see a decline. It is true in the last two or three quarters, expansion has dropped below double digits for the first time. It's an exciting situation. Some people say that a revaluation of the Chinese yuan is inevitable. What would the impact on the gold price be, in your view, if that were to happen? It has to be tremendous because... Uh, Tremendously positive. Yes. Uh, and also on platinum, even more so on platinum, actually. But, um, because uh, of the automobile component? Uh, well, the Chinese are the biggest jewelry buyers of platinum. So jewelry is a price-sensitive topic, and uh, a big cut in the platinum price would, would help. But gold would certainly benefit a great deal. But there's another aspect to it too, of course. The Chinese currency went up. A lot of their mining mines that are currently profitable would, would become unprofitable because, in essence, the Chinese price of gold would go down. So not only would it stimulate domestic consumption of gold, but it would also strangle a lot of domestic production. And mm -hmm. that's a very serious factor. It means we could have a swing of very substantial size in the net Chinese import, which until the beginning of last year was not significant. I mean, it was under 100 tons. In 2007, Vietnam imported more gold than China. But something strange happened in the latter part of last year. And I, I mean, I'm tremendous skeptic about China. I think their entire relationship with the world is fraudulent. But the fact is that Chinese Shanghai Gold Exchange premiums towards the end of last year, suddenly rocketed to double-digit levels, far more than is justified by the price to move, need to move, what you, the price you'd need to move gold. And this continued for about six or eight weeks. Uh, then we started to see stories that, the, for the first time, huge physical shipments of gold to China were happening. So last year was a very dramatic uh, shift in, in the world gold market. Uh, rooted in China. And one looks with great interest to see what the Lunar New Year celebrations do this year. Yeah, well, it's, it's quite amazing that the premiums or the discount or premium that stayed pretty close to the gold price. You know, who knows what's going to happen when the demand for seasonal factors actually kicks in. Yes. 
Is it possible that some people are anticipating higher gold prices and are buying now rather than buying in the fourth quarter, or is that unlikely? In China? In uh, India. Or because of the waiting for the monsoon to come in and the cash crops to be realized, they, they can't buy now. I, I do feel that, uh, I mean, the Indian fathers of brides, vintage 2011 12, are stuck. They're going to have to buy gold for their daughters, otherwise their wives will beat them up. So they know they're going to have to buy. And these people think very carefully about the gold market, and many of them read your material and everybody else's material and think about it. And uh, it's entirely possible that they're more tolerant to a higher price of gold this summer because they think it's going to go in, up in the fall. Let's move a little bit further west and look at another important part of the world in terms of physical gold demand. I'm talking about the Middle East and even over into Turkey. Uh, what do you see happening there in this, uh, at this moment in time? I have to admit I have some difficulty with the Middle East. It's extremely difficult to get uh, online or real-time uh, gold prices there. Uh, you can in Turkey. Turkey was more or less knocked out of the world gold market in 2008 by forces which we have various explanations for, but they do seem to have come back in a reasonable degree, and you can watch the premiums, and they were reasonable buyers in July by uh, very recent standards. However, they're still way below the 200 and 20, 250 ton a year annual pace that they used to absorb gold in. Um, of course, you've got to ask to bear in mind that a large proportion of the uh, buying in the Gulf is actually buying by non resident, resident Indians. Uh, so, to some extent, the prices in India ref give some um, insight into what's going on in the Gulf, too. Yeah, some indication in terms of what gold prices in the Gulf are at any moment in time. In other words, if, if India is a discount, then it's liable that it's uh, probable that uh, it's not, uh, the, the Gulf is at a discount too. What factors uh, basically have a negative impact on gold uh, consumption or gold acquisition in, uh, in India? Is um, the currency the, the major component or are there other things as well? Currency is very important, and when the stock market is strong and foreign portfolio investment in India is strong, and the reserve, if the Reserve Bank of India allows the currency go, to go up, that's a very bullish point for, uh, for gold. Um, the seasonal factor is very pronounced. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about whether the, a good or bad harvest is important, but I've never been able to see myself that it makes much difference. Mm -hmm. There's a fair amount of India that's uh, somewhat industrialized now. And they probably, in terms of disposable income, it's disproportionately influential in the gold market. Has there been any movement toward paper gold products as opposed to physical gold products? At the end of the day, physical is still more important. Uh, the movement towards paper products is, is minimal. Uh, the Indians really seem to like having physical gold in their possession. It's a cultural, traditional thing? It seems very deep-rooted. It also affects the gold market in various countries where there is a significant non-resident Indian population, including the United States, where there's a substantial amount of, India, of gold is bought uh, on the eastern seaboard by, by Indians. Mm -hmm. And then sent back to relatives for weddings and things of that nature? Sometimes, or perhaps hoarded. It's not something that they publicly discuss. What they oh, do I see. It. You mean kept outside of India yeah. by non-resident Indians? Yes. I mean, what they do with it is... Uh, who knows, but the fact is they do buy it and it affects the, the local gold markets quite significantly. Yeah. Is the made, you know, we talk about Indian demand, but it's really demand that's driven by monetary purposes, is it not? In, in other words, you know, in the West we buy coins and bars because gold is money. Uh, in India, because of cultural and traditional reasons, they buy gold fabricated in terms of high carat jewelry. But it is a monetary demand, isn't yes, it? Yes, they're extremely insistent that uh, jewelry, no matter how beautifully it be, be worked, uh, is high, very high carat. Mm -hmm. uh, they simply will not buy the sort of stuff that can be sold in America and uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. So the adornment I, I, aspect it, is just a secondary benefit as opposed to the monetary it aspect? Seems to, be, to them it seems to be a store of wealth. Mm -hmm. Passed on from generation to generation. Portable and ultra-discreet store of wealth. Yeah. They're very interested in the discretion aspect of it, it appears. Yeah. Uh, any other things that you'd like to wrap up with in terms of physical demand um, anywhere in the world? Well, the, there was an interesting uh, phenomenon going on in Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam stated a reasonably good growth rate in the early years of this decade and uh, in the two steps after 2000. And it emerged as a very strong buyer of gold. Uh, the Vietnamese public is unusually sophisticated in its use of gold and the, the Vietnamese banking system was actually 
operating a gold loan, loan banking system. They were lending people gold for general commercial purposes. So, uh, as I said, in 2007, China, Vietnam appears to be importing more gold than China. Unfortunately, the Vietnamese government has, has developed a major um, fit of peak about this there, and they're doing their best to shut down and eradicate the use of gold in the commercial uh, world. Nevertheless, you can work out the price of gold, and, and it does it has been a, it's recently it's been a discount, but early on this year it was at a significant premium, which means now that the gold has to be smuggled. And maybe one day it will open up again. Yeah, I understand gold is the only thing that's used for real estate transactions in Vietnam. I believe, I believe so. Yeah. But the, the, the gold banking uh, function was really quite interesting. It was there was a, a, a sophisticated uh, gold lending uh, function to the public for commercial, general commercial purposes, which they just chose to denominate in gold. Unfortunately, the, uh, the Vietnamese government seems to be very uh, regressive in its view of gold, and the World Gold Council needs to work hard at that. It's just another example of gold intervention by central banks? Banks uh, hate gold. Yeah. Central banks hate gold. Because it's competitive to their currency. Just, to, to, another point, though, of the last few days, you know, is the uh, interest with the Korean purchase of gold for the first time in over 15 years. One wonders whether there's those central banks like Sweet, Switzerland, which are faced with tremendous inflows of speculative capital and detrimental effects on their uh, exchange rate. It might not eventually dawn on them. I mean, if rather than have people buy Swiss francs, why don't we just go and buy, match it with gold purchases? Yeah. And in effect, divert the flow of speculative buying of Swiss francs into the gold market and pull the Swiss economy out of the line of fire. Yeah. That may be what was motivating the Koreans. But isn't that sort of happening? You know, both Swiss franc is strengthening and gold is strengthening at the same time. Yes, but but the Swiss franc bank, Swiss national bank, so far not. Um, taken the admittedly very embarrassing step of reversing its huge sales of gold yes. of 10 years ago, which in retrospect, of course, were completely stupid. Um, but the point is that if you, if you want to manage your currency to prevent it depreciating too much for, to protect your exporters, purchasing gold with in, inflows of speculative capital that might come your way is a perfectly rational thing to do. Yes, understood. And uh, one wonders whether some of the central banks are beginning to think about that. Well, maybe they're thinking about it, and maybe that's going to happen uh, in the future. We'll see I think the, the Korean purchase of Mao Zedong this week was a very important development. Yeah, there have been a number of wake-up calls that way with regard to central banks. And, but Korea is particularly important because they've got this ballooning uh, foreign exchange reserve situation. Plus, they are, in fact, a, a very close client to the United States. Yeah. So it's not like Mexico or India, who've been, had a pretty negative attitude to America most of the time. Yeah. For as close basically an American poodle like Korea to start buying gold, is a, 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 that's a big change. But the bottom line is watch the demand for physical gold around the world because that's a good indication of where the gold price is going. Well, there's no doubt, as you have very accurately called this summer, James, that when the West gets alarmed, they can push the gold price a long way. Uh, I like to think of my work as offering people who own significant amounts of gold important comfort in the morning when they're wondering whether their, their net worth is going to die because the gold price is going to collapse. The, uh, the, pre the premiums tell you how much, what the downside is because the fact of the matter is that India appears to be willing to buy the entire world gold supply at the right price. Mm, understood. John, thank you very much. John Bremo of goldjottings.com.